Thanks, Rachel. Um, and thanks, everybody, for being here. And uh, I'm really excited to be a part of the SIQR um, this year. Um, I'll get right to it. Uh, these, uh, these remarks are somewhat intrepid. And uh, I thought that this is the right group to have this conversation with. Um, both a, a group that I expect is committed to issues of racial justice in our society and can actually um, find this theoretical language legible. Um, so I'm going to take some risks here and look forward to the conversation that, that comes after. So my remarks this, after, um, this afternoon, this morning, um, <laughs> um, grew out of a 10-year study that I conducted with the help of a team of graduate students on the racial resegregation of a public school district in the United States. Portions of this study were published recently in a book entitled uh, Resegregation as Curriculum, uh, the, the Meaning of the New Segregation in U.S. Public Schools, which I co-authored with Dr. Kathy Kinslow. Uh, during the decade plus we spent on this project, I had the occasion to attend seminars on North American indigenous philosophy, um, one feature of which is an emphasis on the agency of non-human things and the importance of our ethical relationship beyond the human. Um, also during that time, that time frame, the new materials philosophy of science literature came onto the scene, at least in the field of education, and as someone with a bachelor's degree of, of science in the field of physics, I especially was taken with Karen Barad's writing on quantum mechanics and her arguments for an expanded ontology that she calls agential realism. Finally, I've been fortunate to find myself at the University of Oregon, which is home to some of the most highly ranked centers of pragmatist philosophy scholarship in the world, and has considerably extended my understanding of this tradition of thought. Of particular relevance here, um, I have learned that one of the early figures in the pragmatist tradition, Charles Sanders Peirce, came to the conclusion late in his life that agency was a feature of all existence and made efforts to develop a system of logic and material semiotics that reflected this view. I did not set out over 10 years ago to study the non-human agency of institutionalized racism um, in a resegregating school district. I did not have that language available to me at the time the study was initiated. However, I found my later study of agent ontologies began to influence my research on the operation of racism in our schools. By the time the study was complete, I had become persuaded that racism is protean in nature. It does not sit still for our descriptions of its operations. I have become convinced that in our efforts to study racism, we become entangled with the phenomenon in ways that co-constitute us as subjects and racism in particular forms. In other words, it is, in Broadian's terms, agential. I've also become persuaded that, drawing on indigenous studies and practice agent ontologies, here comes the intrepid part, um, racism behaves with something that might reasonably be called purpose. And that thinking of racism as a purposeful agent has specific methodological and analytical implications. Um, the idea that racism has its own form of protean agency, or that it acts in purposeful ways, is not exactly new. The idea that racism is multifaceted, fluid, and adapts to our efforts to resist it is quite common in both scholarship and popular culture. Michelle Alexander, in her widely cited and positively reviewed book, The New Jim Crow, Mass Incarceration in the Age of Colorblindness, provides one of the most succinct um, distillations of this view that I've found. She writes, any candid observer of American racial history must acknowledge that racism is highly adaptable. The rules and reasons the political system employs to enforce status relations of any kind, including racial hierarchy, evolve and change as they are challenged. The value and efforts to abolish slavery and Jim Crow and to achieve greater racial equality have brought about significant changes in the legal framework of American society, new rules of the game, so to speak. These new rules have been justified by new rhetoric, new language, um, and a new social consensus, while producing many of the same results. This dynamic, which legal scholar Riva Siegel has dubbed preservation through translation, is the process through which white privilege is maintained, though the rules and rhetoric change. People who spend their lives studying and working against the currents of racism are intimately familiar with this resilience and adaptability of racism. Chattel slavery was overthrown in the US, and racism reformed as tenant farmer wage slavery and the passage of laws that stripped black citizens of their basic human and civil rights, what in US history is call, are called Jim Crow laws. Eventually, those seeking, to resist <coughs> those seeking to resist racism developed a language for naming this new form of racism and, and a political framework for resisting it, the civil rights movement. Though that mo through that movement, Jim Crow laws were abolished, civil rights and voting rights laws were passed, courts required race the re racial desegregation of schooling, and some additional equity was temporarily achieved. In response, racism changed form once again. It moved out of the explicit legal code and into school zoning practices. 
tacit motivations influencing real estate markets, the manipulation of our state and federal courts, and the implicit bias in the criminal justice system. Where school segregation is concerned, court decisions have reinterpreted school des desegregation laws in a manner that has resulted in the loss of almost all progress we have made on that front since 1968. So here's the top line is the number of, of black students in majority mi minority schools with over 50% minority students. So in 1968, we were somewhere just below 80%. Um, the lowest our desegregation got was in the 1980s, and we've now crept back up, and actually there's another data point on this where we've exceeded the rate of racial segregation in U.S. public schools by that index. Um, so we're now more segregated than we've ever been before. Um, more disconcerting, the very conceptual vocabulary that enabled the passage of the civil rights legislation has been appropriated by politicians and activists hostile to state-enforced school um, equality. The same colorblind rhetoric that informed the 1954 Brown v. Board of Education U.S. Supreme Court decision mandating the desegregation of schools is now used to block efforts to desegregate schools. More recent, most recently, the idea of colorblind jurisprudence was invoked in a 2007 Parents United versus Seattle Unified School District Supreme Court case to justify striking down a district's voluntary desegregation plan on the grounds, and this was a group of mostly white parents from the suburbs um, opposing the desegregation plan, on the grounds that no school policy should be explicitly organized around the racial identity of its students ever. Martin Luther King's ideal of a country where children would be judged not by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character, was literally quoted as part of the argument used to strike down an effort to desegregate, to desegregate public schools. More broadly, Michelle Alexander documents how the reproduction of second-class citizenship for black people in the United States is now being affected through the courts and penal system. The mass incarceration of black citizens, um, most numerably black men, results in their being stripped of voting rights, civil rights, wealth, and of course freedom. The result is the political and civic disempowerment of nearly a third of U.S. black male citizens. So the research literature refers to institutionalized racism as more than just adaptable. We also regularly refer to racism as behaving in purposeful ways. I'm going to quickly scroll through a couple of dozen uh, quotes here to, just to illustrate how common this kind of, uh, of language is. Robert Ber Berlusconi in The Phenomenology of the Political writes, racism wants to make its targets disappear, but does not want them to disappear into anonymity. It wants to see them without, s without seeing them. It wants to identify its targets unambiguously. The bold here, if you can see it, is mine. Modern racism seeks to, to deny agency, cognitive capacity, and intellectual histories of black people. Paul Gilroy, The Black Atlantic. Um, Son of Baldwin, a really great Tumblr feed if you've never seen it before writes, the new, re the new racism wants the accused not only to forget history, disregard experience, discount psychology, and ignore custom, but to interpret racism as, the on as only conscious, exceptional, individual, intentional, and overt. Therefore, the new racism wants to exclude blacks. Interestingly, new racism wants to be democratic and respectable. Um, as history is abolished, space becomes all important, and thus racism wants to define territories and create homelands. When you do not know how racism works, it affects you without your being aware of it. When you are conscious of it, racism wants to be dialogued with 24-7. <laughs> Contrary to the slogan that Western racism wants to make the world uniform, this is Zizek, um, racism always speaks of an ideal otherness. Uh, uh, this is Steve Biko, the great uh, uh, South African activist, writes, the white racism seeks to prey upon People. The ideology that ideally, uh, as an ideology, racism seeks to both legitimate the inequality and proclaim the superiority of the racial group that constitutes the status quo. The new racism seeks to generate a sense of nationalist as natural. Whiteness wants me to be its pawn. Here's some uh, uh, an Asian American scholar writing about the uh, the way in which whiteness affects and the relationships between black and Asian constituencies. Um, and what I think white supremacy does for me is a very sort of personal way. Um, is it demands a sort of surrender. White supremacy wants you to surrender everything. Now, I don't think we could attribute all of those comments to just sort of an excess of, uh, of uh, prose flourishes. Um, I don't think any of the authors, of course, were trying to make an argument for an agentially realist conception of racism. Um, still, the frequency with which this, such phraseology appears in the literature, and we could have found many more easily, um, is indicative of more than, I think, just sloppy prose style. There's something about the phenomenon of racism, white supremacy, anti-blackness, um, 
that we experience as mutable and insidious, as capable of subverting our efforts to resist it, and as capable of co-opting us into serving its ends despite our contrary intentions. In my remarks today, I want to consider what it would mean to take that collective intuition a little more seriously. I want to think about what it would mean to make an analytic of the idea that racism is an agent, has an agential form of being. Writing agency. So what does it mean to write agency? Note that I do not ask what it means to write about agency. Because writing about agency would presume that agents are already existing objects, albeit dynamic objects, just waiting to be described, and the researcher and readers already existing eth ethically disengaged subjects. I worry sometimes that this is how Barad's notion of agential realism is frequently appropriated by social science scholars. Instead of describing objects and institu uh, institutions, we end up describing non-human agents in terms of their inertial resistance to human activity. This conceptualization can sneak into our vocabulary, even when it is not explicitly intended, such as when Jane Bennett uses the term tra trajectory to describe agential assemblages. Trajectory refers in classical physics to the inertial path an object takes as a result of being acted upon by an outside force. It is the opposite of agency. When it is used in this way to convey a dynamism or slipperiness to the objects of our study, agential realism risks becoming little more than phenomenology with a new vocabulary. Such descriptions of non-human agents may highlight overlooked features of the objects of our study, but they entail no transformation of the knower. They leave the Western humanist spectator subject intact. What is missed here is the way, according to Barad's theories, both inquiring agents and agential objects of study are co-constituted in the entanglements of inquiry and writing. <coughs> the way we are produced as subjects in our inquiry. I'm not alone in this concern. Maggie, Maggie McClure, in her keynote to the International Congress of Qualitative Inquiry, um, it is difficult to think, I, <laughs> it was the only picture I could find, it was the, <laughs> and I didn't, on my computer it was small, <laughs> so, so it worked. <laughs> the, other, the other thing is, I thought like, after I was done, like, why do I have pictures? They're sitting right here in the audience, but, for those of you who don't know Maggie, right here she is. Uh, Maggie writes, it is, it is difficult to think outside of enlightenment structures of the Cartesian self. And, stories, and the stories it tells about progress, reason, and the advancement of knowledge. So although we have come a long way in formulating cartographies of, for new materialist research, we are necessarily some way from the anticipated ontological transformation uh, of our field. I think we continue to underestimate the sheer difficulty of shedding the anthropocentrism that is built into our worldviews and our language habits. Um, similarly, Hilary Lynn Stiguchi, <laughs> better picture there, thank you. <laughs> writes of the undertow of inherited habits of enlightenment metaphysics in her essay, Images of Thinking and, and Feminist Materialism. She writes, even as post-structuralist informed feminist researchers, we were still drawn into habitual practices of producing root book thinking and having problems get, getting past an irresistible fascular root thinking. The territory of qualitative inquiry is so heavily sedimented that it requires very hard collaborative work to deterritorialize its habitual ways of thinking and practicing in order for new and different research practices and subjectivities to emerge. Within the new materialist literature, Deleuze and Guattari's conceptual vocabulary have been most frequently adopted to theorize a social research practice beyond the observing Western subject. As Elizabeth St. Pierre observes in her 2011 essay, Refusing Being Human in Humanist Qualitative Inquiry, she writes, Deleuze and Guattari added much to the work by offering, in their normative ontology, a variety of interlocking concepts to move away from the I, including hexiety, rhizome, and assemblage. When people begin to think of human being as entanglement, hexity, assemblage, and rhizome, something happens to them that they can only get a grip on again by letting go of their ability to say I. Important work has been, has been and continues to be done using this theoretical vocabulary. In education, I'm thinking of Dr. Taguchi's work producing diffractive analysis using minor, min, minoritarian influences to disrupt majoritarian norms and subject positions and to move beyond stabilizing dichotomies or Lisa Mazet's writing about voices without organs, a concept used to enact, quote, enact thinking without a subject. However, significant questions have been raised about the limitations of Deleuzian asubjectivity, or the limitations of its current use, for the analysis of systemic forms of oppression. The decoupling of subjectivity from relatively stable forms of identity through which contemporary power dynamics are encoded is not assumed to be an unalloy unalloyed benefit by feminists working with the new materialist philosophies. Claire Colebrook, for example, commenting on Deleuze and Guattari's reading of Virginia Woolf, not as a woman, but as becoming woman, asks, 
quote, just what are Deleuze and Guattari doing when they take Wolf and the women's movement away from the concepts of identity, recognition, emancipation, and the subject towards a new plane of becoming? Other feminist scholars, such as Elizabeth, Elizabeth Gross, uh, Jess Beer Pouar, Rosie Berdotti, and Anna Bojic have expressed similar caution even as they find utility in Deleuze and Guattari's work. <coughs> scholars analyzing systemic racism, white supremacy, anti-blackness, and settler colonialism have expressed similar misgivings, sometimes with more urgency. Gatry Spivak, in Can the Subaltern Speak, famously raised the concern that the failure of Deleuze and Guattari to consider relations between desire, power, and subjectivity renders them incapable of articulating a theory of interests. Alexander Wahelier, who takes up the vocabulary of assemblage in his book, Habeas Viscus, offers, we should all remain cautious about the complete disavowal of subjectivity in theoretical discourse, because within the context of Anglo -American, the Anglo-American Academy, more often than not, an insistence on transcending limited notions of the subject or identity leads to the neglect of race as a critical category, as we have seen in scholars such as Judith Butler. Sarah Ahmed offers a similar caution. We hope, <coughs> we hope, we, the hope, the hope invested in new terms, movement, becoming, assemblages, capacities, can thus be considered a way of overing, as if these terms are how we get over the categories themselves. These concerns are not simply a nostalgia for identity politics. They are instead an increasingly common expression of worry that in the reach for social analysis that emphasizes the agential, emergent, deterritorializing, materializing fluidity of things, scholars will slip back into empirically well-established patterns of the erasure of black, brown, and indigenous lives, and that materiality will be selectively remembered and analyzed in a way that reproduces racist and settler colonialist subjection and violence. What this means to me is it is not enough to seek a transformation of our anti-racist politics through a general dissolution um, or dilution of the subject. What we need in addition is an account of the specific subject-producing effects of ontoepistemic onto entanglements that move beyond an emphasis on fluidity. It also requires a normative practice of navigating the subject-producing space of these politically and ethically fraught entanglements, as well as an account of the risk that other agents at times may co-opt us and diminish our agency. So my own experience writing about racial segregation in public schools in the US corroborates the concerns just raised. I have found the idea, and I, I may risk uh, um, getting kicked off the boat right now. Um, I've, I found the idea of letting go of the first person subject when writing to be a confusing one. Um, not because I'm so attached to my own sort of inner space of the subjective eye, but <coughs> after years and years, decades of, uh, of being um, studying post-structuralism, I regard the humanist first person subject to already be socially distributed phenomenon. And so any writing of I in my prose already feels like a sort of out of body semi-fluid fiction. Right? I'm always I'm sitting in front of the computer and I really don't know if I'm writing or not. Um, if a self-conscious, you know, it's a self-conscious performance shaped by my context, not a transparent voice emanating from my own transcendental humanist consciousness. There are often moments where the writing feels like it carries me and I am an epiphenomenon of its currents. Um, oddly, these moments are, uh, where my agency seems to dissolve are pleasant. <laughs> there are also moments where the language resists me, where I do not have the agency to make the words do what I will, and in these moments, the boundaries of myself feel as if they are clearest, and yet I almost experience these with acute frustration. Um, there are also moments where the writing process changes my thoughts and feelings about a matter um, midstream, an epiphany or a recognition of a contradiction in my prior expectations. It's rare that I feel mastery of, uh, of the language and social forces within which I work and that I write about. This experience is especially acute when I write about racist and racial, racializing social processes. Racism has proven capable of co-opting even the most sophisticated and earnest minds of the last century. This fact inspires worry about the moves being made in and the flows and turbulence that constitute my writing. I find I distrust the pleasures and frustrations of writing. Their import is not entirely legible to me. I'm not referring here to a gen generic anxiety about being co-opted into white supremacist discourses when I write. That's a valid concern. I have more specific analytic pitfalls in mind. One that I expect many of you will find familiar is the difficulty maintaining focus on a single unit of analysis when studying racism. The empirical substance, the empirical substance of our study of school segregation did not yield a sing um, to a single theoretical framework on ontology of racism. There were moments in our study when we documented instances of individual experiences of racism. 
In these cases, using individual units of analysis with conceptual vo vocabulary drawn from the discipline of psychology, like bias and racial microaggressions, made sense. The manifestations of racism at the individual level were real and suggested possible sites of intervention in the resegregation process. There were other moments uh, in our study where the use of Marxist or critical theoretic frameworks made sense, such as in the analysis of the way property uh, value politics shaped school zoning li uh, lines in ways that reproduced racial segregation. The ideologies that permitted people to naturalize these zoning policies as an effect of general uh, physical geography or the need for smaller schools, thus eluding their responsibility for increased racial segregation of schools, was also real. This reality suggested other possi possible sites of inter intervention in the resegregation process. In still other moments, Kathy and I found ourselves using a post-structuralist theory to track the signifiers of racial identity that marked each of the various schools in the district and how that in turn contributed to the production of students as racialized subjects. Post-structuralism provided a vocabulary for describing the circulation of racial uh, and racist signifiers of difference that were not derivative of economic dynamics, but nonetheless had real material consequences. These discursive analyses of the operation of racism in Riverton School District also suggested possible sites of intervention in the resegregation process. These were not simply views that could be added together in some cumulative fashion. Um, each of these theoretical frameworks also carried, its carried with it critiques that undermine the ontological claims of the others. Individual psychological interpretations of the operation of racism ignored the structural features of institutionalized white supremacy. Marxism treated, treats individual consciousness as an ideological fact, not as a cause of structural inequality. Post-structuralism presupposes the discursive signifiers of racial difference operate independently of and to some extent determine the economies of, of the resegregation. Contra-Marxism. The subject constitu constituting effects of these theoretical frameworks were also at odds with one another. Uh, positivist and, and interpretivist descriptions positioned us as humanist spectator subjects. Critical frameworks positioned us as subversive subjects. Uh, possessed of a privileged insight that presumed a certain shared political project. Post-structuralist frameworks positioned us as ironic cosmopolitan subjects, uh, suspicious of any totalizing epistemic or normative frame, and committed to a politics of problematizing certainty. Each framework provided a different ontological and ethical political engagement with the racial resegregation of schools. Close empirical scrutiny of the racial resegregation of schools compelled us to each of these forms of analysis in different ways, and yet they were difficult to maintain simultaneously. Note the similarities here um, between these incommensurabilities and Barad's account of the diffraction gradient experiments that reveal wave particle duality of light. In those quantum physics experiments, one inquiry apparatus can document the wave nature of light. Another inquiry apparatus, uh, inquiry apparatus can document the particle nature of light. But decades of increasingly sophisticated experiments have confirmed that these two manifestations of light cannot be uh, documented in the exact, with the exact same um, experimental apparatus. Under close scrutiny, each material performance of light excludes the other. Nonetheless, light is both wave and particle. It is for these reasons that Barad argues that it makes sense to think of light in these, exper in these experiments as agential. In making this claim, she is not claiming that light has a self-conscious mind and makes plans. She is not anthropomorphizing light. She is acknowledging its protean nature and the way quantum reality actively responds to our efforts to measure it in a manner that makes it impossible to capture it in a single totalizing representation. I offer it makes sense to think of racism as an ontological agent for many of the same reasons that Barad suggests light is agential. Depending upon how we interact with it in our inquiries and activism, racism manifests as an individual phenomenon, as a socioeconomic phenomenon, and as a discursive semiotic phenomenon. All of those manifestations are real. In our inquiries, and to some extent the, audience, uh, the audiences to whom we write, are constituted differently as political subjects and emerge with different and at times incommensurable horizons of ethical and political action. It is important, I think, to emphasize that this is not an endorsement of mere perspectivalism. The idea that we can see racism um, from many different angles, each of which adds to our overall understanding. The view of racism here is more uncanny. It implies that some part of the being of racism exists beyond our ability to represent it, because it may be constituting us through our representational activity. Consider the implications. This means that our conceptual frameworks for analyzing racism potentially operate as instruments of our subjection to racism. It is not difficult to imagine this, because we see it happen all the time. At least, I think I see it happen all the time. Um, positivist forms of scholarship can be used to great effect in efforts to advocate for more equity in schooling. 
In the current data-driven ethos in the US policymaking circles, however, the insistence that policy proposals be supported by empirical evidence defined in a narrow fashion have been used to silence advocacy for racial justice as often as is used to support it. For example, the No Child Left Behind legislation and its recent update, the Every Student Succeeds Act, um, requires that federally funded education programs be funded only if they can provide measurable evidence of impact. However, we lack the ability to create quantitative indexes of many of the injuries of racism. In this kind of policy context, such injuries are ignored and the ideal of empirical objectivity can end up creating conditions that sustain racial violence. Marxist analysis can also be an effective tool for anti-racist advocacy by showing the endemic links between capitalism and institutionalized racism. However, Marxist theory has also been deployed to invalidate scholarship that makes racism a central category of analysis. Framing the focus on racism as a distraction from the real economic causes of social suffering and a way to divide the proletariat. In such circumstances, an emphasis on the political economy of oppression serves to silence voices that seek to describe aspects of racialized oppression that are not reducible to economic dynamics. Post-structuralist critiques of racial essentialism have likewise proved useful in the struggle against racism by exploding oversimplifications that erase the complexity of people's lives and communities. However, post-structuralism has also been deployed in ways that function to invalidate the warrant of experiential reports about the material effects of racism. In this way, post-structuralist social analysis can end up silencing voices speaking back against white supremacy. We can, of course, interpret such excesses as the consequence of misplaced enthusiasm on the part of individual scholars, not a reflection on the theories themselves. But the pattern of high theory being co-opted into serving as a barrier to the analysis of white supremacy is empirically well established. It seems to demand a more conceptually and politically robust response than a few bad apples take things too far. One possible such response, I think, is made available through agential realism. Understanding racism not as a collection of psychological or sociological flaws awaiting diagnosis and description, but as a protean material semiotic agent that moves in response to our efforts to counter, counteract it, offers the possibility of a differential analytical politics. It would mean any effort to privilege a particular analysis of the reality of racism in a totalizing fashion would constitute an underestimation of the ontological mutability of racism and its co-constitution of us through preferred practices of analysis. Disciplinary, disciplinary and theoretical partisanship, therefore, would be by definition unrealistic or at least under-realistic, because it would involve ignoring real manifestations of racism that occur through the very knowledge projects we engage in to resist it. Agential realist scholarship on racism would require relinquishment of neoliberal narratives of progress that we imply we'll be able to eradicate um, racism in some final fashion, because racism could always emerge in a different ontological formation. More importantly, our confidence in the possibility of mastery um, always risks becoming the mechanism of our co-optation. Instead, an agential realist view of racism would recommend a long-term cultural and political strategy of containment and reduction in which anti-racist scholarship and activism be as protean and shape-shifting as racism itself and not be seduced by dreams of a final resolution. In this, an agential realist view reaches a conclusion similar to the racial realism of Derrick Bell and the critical race theorists, as well as um, some uh, anti-blackness scholars um, who write in an Afro-pessimist register. They maintain that pessimism is a more effective political strategy in the struggle against white supremacy. So for all of these reasons, I'm increasingly persuaded that it makes sense to think of racism in agential terms. The question follows then, of what practical consequences such a theoretical um, theorization of racism for our research design and practice? To warrant such a pr profound shift in the ontology of the object of study, um, it needs to provide something more than a license to be theoretically promiscuous, I personally don't need such a license. Um, and maybe a stiff dose of paranoia about our own thought. I certainly don't need any more of that. <laughs> it needs to offer something con some concrete analytical advantages. Here's where I've found the indigenous philosophy, uh, um, I found indigenous philosophy in Charles Sanders Peirce's Material Semiotics most helpful. As I mentioned earlier, both of these philosophical literatures developed conceptions of non-human agency. Like Barad, they see relations with other agents being mutually cons um, constituting. Also, like Barad, they do not conceive of non-human agency as conscious or anthropomorphic. Unlike Barad's theories, however, they both feature conceptions of non-human agency as being directed towards ends that define them. This feature has advantages when trying to think about putting agential realism into methodological practice. There is not, <laughs> there's not time today to provide a literature review um, in these areas of study, so I'll just mention a few notable texts that I find very useful. Vine Deloria's classic Spirit and Reason, um, 
is always worth our time. Um, as is Robert Bungie's An American Earth Philosophy. This book is almost impossible to get. I have a PDF copy, so if you want it, you can send it to me. It went out of print like two decades ago, but it should go back into print. Um, and Kathleen Westcott and Eva Garut's essay on the ontology of Anishinaabe narratives. Later today, I'm going to be facilitating a discussion uh, about the intersection of, of indigenous philosophies, uh, the possible intersections, and new materialism in one of the workshops for this conference. Um, so in that one, I'll provide more examples and an extensive bibliography. Uh, suffice to, to, for now to say that this literature is vast. Um, as for Peirce's pragmatic semiotics, um, it's taken up by some anthropologists as an alternative to the overemphasis on linguistic mediation and post-structuralism. Um, so the book How Forests Think um, by Edward, Eduardo Cohn is a good example of this, and I highly recommend it. Um, I found John Sheriff and T.L. Short's erudite commentaries on Peirce's semiotics extremely helpful as well. Peirce's semiotics is unique in that it is not so much a theory of representation, but instead a theory about habits of interpretation and response. Um, although Peirce originally began by trying to develop a logic of human inquiry, he eventually concluded that these habits of interpretation and response were not unique to human or even organic life, but pervaded all things. All things were involved, according to Peirce, in ongoing inquiry, broadly defined. What is important for our discussion is that habits for Peirce are always directed towards some future state of affairs that does not yet exist. They are a tendency towards possibility, or what he calls being in futuro. Um, possibilities for Peirce were ontologically substantive, because impossibility is real, possibility is also real. Um, they are a tendency, uh, the possibilities exist and present material, and present materiality organizes itself in anticipation of these possibilities. It is possibility of future ordered states towards which an entity tends that gives an entity its identity and agency, according to this Persian framework. Peirce was explicitly reinvigorating an old Aristotelian distinction um, between efficient causes and final causes. Efficient causes are mechanical causes. One thing puts another into motion. A turn of the key starts an engine. The fire under a pot boils the water. Final causes are future states without which things or events wouldn't exist. We have pencils because we need to write. We have alarm clocks because we need to get up. We have conferences because we want to discuss challenging topics with intelligent, earnest people. <laughs> T.L. Short observes that this latter conception of causation is colloquially, colloquially referred to as purpose, as in the purpose of a pencil is to be used in writing, without any implications of anthropomorphism. He argues that this language is clearer than that of first causes and being in futuro, and therefore should be used. This formulation of non-human agency provides a number of advantages for putting agential realism into pra practice, and specifically for applying it to the study of racism. I will mention three that I think are most significant, and then we'll wrap up. First, the conception of agents being defined by the possibility of future ordered states towards which they, are, they tend helps us distinguish between agents and non-agents. I think this is a really important issue for the application of agential realism um, to social analysis. T.L. Short points out that in conditions of equilibrium, it is difficult to tell the difference between agents and non-agents. However, if the activity of a non-agent is disrupted, it will remain disrupted until acted on by an outside force. If my car breaks down, it does not fix itself, sadly. Um, in contrast, if the activity of an agent is disrupted, it will reorganize and adapt in relation to its defining being in futuro. A cherry seed, for example, is an agent defined by the future general possibility of becoming a cherry tree. If it begins to grow and its growth is interrupted by not enough light or water, it will grow differently, seek light and water, and seek out the form of some kind of cherry tree. A school is a collective agent that exists to educate people. Its building can burn down and its books can disappear, but the constituents of the school will find a place to meet nonetheless. Um, this definition of agency would suggest that researchers should look for moments when the phenomena they study are responding to significant changes or existential transformations in order to discern their agential character. Um, where segregation is concerned, I began to think of racism as a transubstantial agent defined by the purpose of producing racial hierarchies of wealth and power. The activity of racism has been disrupted in many ways through the Civil War and the Civil Rights Movement and myriad forms of activism. The history of racism, as I described earlier, is one of adapting to these interventions, reforming around the possibility of racialized and racist social hierarchies. The resegregation study was an examination of racism and a slow but inex inexorable process of adapting to the disruptions of court-ordered desegregation. This theorization of racism as an agent also provided some re refinement of my conception of what an agent in our study actually was. Being in futuro, according to Peirce, 
always refers to a particular ordered state of affairs, not some, uh, it has to be particular because it's not deterministic in its outcome, but the defining possibility must be specific enough to give form to the activity of the agent, to organize its becoming in identifiable ways. Racism, as a term, can refer to the production of arbitrary hierarchies between any groups based on their racial identity. Um, some people talk about reverse racism. Um, and therefore, it did not feel specific enough for our study. We eventually, in our book, chose to use the term whiteness, white supremacy, or anti-blackness to refer to specific forms of ordering activity we saw at work in our study. So it doesn't make any sense to me anymore, even though I titled the paper racism an agent. It makes more sense to talk about whiteness as an agent or anti-blackness as an agent. Um, second, the purposive conception of agency transforms the practice of triangulation. Traditional triangulation presumes a passive, stable object of study and the ideal of a spectator subject. It calls for the use of multiple methods of description and representation in pursuit of a better unified picture of the object of study. An agential realist practice of triangulation would still employ multiple forms of description and representation, but with a different purpose. In this case, different models of description would be used in response to a constantly adapting and changing agential object of study. There would be no anticipation of a final convergent integrated representation. Instead, the multiple practices of inquiry would be deployed to put objects of study into an agential motion so as to better discern the being in futuro that organizes and defines their agency. This would include the agency of various forms of materiality that emerge in research entanglements, as well as transformations of our own identity, desires, and subjectivity. As previously commented in our study, the resegregation of Riverton schools shifted between individual structural and economic discursive units of analysis throughout. So we were doing that before we even had words to describe what we were doing. In fact, I felt guilty about it earlier when I started the study because I couldn't define my, um, my uh, unit of analysis, which I always tell my doc students they need to do first before they start a study. Um, so I was feeling really hypocritical. So maybe this paper is just an elaborate rationalization so I don't have to feel that way. <laughs> um, third, the theorization of agency provides a vision of what concretely establishing onto, um, onto ethical relationships with non-human agents might look like. This, is, I think, is also very important for agential realism. We have to figure out what it means to be an ethical relationship to non-human um, things, entities. It would involve the negotiation of shared divergent purposes, shared or divergent purposes. In the, in the negotiation of these purposes, this would at times require relinquishing our initial priorities and allowing them to be transformed by the purposes of those people, communities, and things with whom or with which we are becoming entangled. It is here that I believe indigenous traditions of thought are most ahead of Western philosophical traditions. Indigenous tr studies scholars have written at length about establishing and maintaining ethically reciprocal relations with non-human agents. And they have been a great deal of writing in the research literature lately about practices of refusal within um, inquiry and analysis. In our study of school desegregation, resegregation, to the extent that agential re realism was the primary unit of our analysis, we were opposed to its organizing ends. Our, efforts then, our effort then was not to negotiate shared ends, but to engage it adversarially to find and evoke non-patronizing forms of solidarity with the students we, inter we interviewed in the study as a way of working against the grain of the dehumanizing effects of the segregation they were experiencing. In the writing, we struggled to refuse and resist the subject constituting effects of agential whiteness, e such as the neoliberal desire to tell narratives of progress. Um, and that, was, that struggle was real. Um, so I'll stop there. This work is ongoing, of course. And all I've said remains preliminary, in some cases speculative, but I hope I've given you some sense of why I end up thinking that it makes sense to start thinking about racism as an, as an agential being and what it would mean for us as scholars. So.